So welcome, uh, I'm Matt Turner. I'm gonna talk about dynamically testing individual microservice releases in production, which is a bit of a mouthful, but I wanted to get across what we're sort of actually gonna be talking about, which is to test uh, on an ongoing basis uh, you know, new releases of an individual service as part of a more complicated, uh, bigger set of microservices. So let's, let's dive into what that means. So yeah, lots to talk about, a lot of these uh, a lot of these topics I'm only going to be touching on kind of briefly. It's a bit of background. The meat of this really is in sort of the Istio config, what we, what we can do with this, uh, and the automation that I've started to build for it. But I will just touch on um, a bit of background as well. Um, I can't see my own slides from here, so I'll have to lean in occasionally. To remember what I promised I was going to say. Um, I won't have to leave that list out. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a software engineer at Tetrate. Tetrate was founded to solve the problem of using service meshes at scale. Um, our management plane provides a layer on top of one or more Istio meshes. It'll install them for you, upgrade them for you, uh, and it uses the Tetra Istio distribution for that, which is a build of upstream Istio. We haven't forked it, but it is fully FIPS compliant. And you can then use our UI, or you can give simple high-level config, and we'll render that down to all the complicated Istio config you need for secure cross-cluster communication. And if you plug into your identity provider, we'll also let you uh, set up inheritable hierarchical permissions across all of that so that people can do mesh ops in, in controlled ways. A little bit about you maybe. Uh, who, who's never used Istio or another service mesh? Okay, that's probably half of you. Cool, who is sort of a beginner, can make it do something? That's probably the other half. And who, anybody consider themselves sort of an expert? Like if I give you a problem, you write the config to fix it? Okay, a few people. That's cool. I guess I've sort of, I've sort of got this about right then. So I'm actually going to talk about this from the perspective of, of the problem we're trying to solve. And I would then introduce, you know, a service mesh, uh, Istio in, in my demo as being the, like the way to solve that. But this is not like an Istio talk. This isn't a deep dive. So hopefully this will take people uh, through it who haven't seen it before. So briefly, microservices, right? What do they, what do they look like in production? They might look like this. Um, this, is, this is a small part of Netflix's service topology, apparently. Um, they wouldn't give a, a higher res image, so maybe they're a little embarrassed for people to be able to read what's actually going on. Um, of course, you, know, you can redraw it to make it more simple, make it easier to read. Um, this is also Netflix, apparently. They've maybe got a little more connectivity than, uh, than they should have. But you know, when, we do a, when we do a talk, when we do a demo, we're, we're probably looking at something like this, right? Uh, a simpler system. Uh, this might be, you know, part of your system in isolation. This might be your whole system if you're a new startup. Or this, this might be, um, for the reason read the DOMA paper from, from Uber. That's a really good way of talking about breaking things up into little isolated uh, sections. Oh, I think there's some animation on this slide that I had forgotten about. There we go. Um, I'll probably come back to this point, actually. Oh, I forgot this animated. This wasn't meant to do that. Um, so there's a slightly thicker arrow there. So when we've got a given operation, you know, we've, so we've got a user, uh, we've got some, some web APIs that we're calling, some external services, we've got a database for persistence. And any given operation that a user performs probably isn't going to hit all the services, right? Uh, you know, a user's request, a distributed transaction, uh, might even end up going through a linear chain of services like this. You know, more than likely, some of these services are going to call multiple others. Uh, but for any particular path, you know, we can look at it like this. Um, and if it's, if it's linear, then it sort of forms a chain, and we can reason about things as a, as a chain. Now, this isn't what I'm, you know, this isn't necessary for what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about applies to, to the big messes that we've seen before, but this is the mental model I'll be using, right? This is the example, because we can actually reason about it. So imagine, you know, one path, a uh, user makes a request, service calls service calls service. And to be honest, it often, I mean, it often is true. Like, telcos are very big on this. Um, yeah, they might have a, a, like a site by a radio mast that's got a firewall and an app box and a media compressor and all kinds of other stuff. And they will define chains out of them. So depending on you know, who you are, you know, what service plan you've bought, whether you're roaming or native to their network, they're going to send you down different paths because they might firewall some people. They might give some people more media services than others. Um, so sort of linear chains like this are, are more common than you think. And, and as I say, it's a, it's a mental model we can use um, for... Uh, more com arbitrarily more complicated systems. This is why the animation's here. Um, if you, and if you think about your services a little bit, 
then they probably fall into a few different categories, right? So we probably have the blue things as sort of back ends. They actually do the business logic, the heavy lifting. But, in order to, but these web APIs, right? Maybe one returns XML because it's from the 90s. Maybe one is accessed over an IPsec tunnel, right? Hands up if you work in finance. We could hide those complexities and those nastiness by making services that sort of shim them, right? So internally, the blue services can all talk gRPC. They can all use our internal auth mechanisms and rate limiting mechanisms. And, we, and they, can, they will use those way, mechanisms to talk to the shim services, which will then not do any logic, but take care of the sort of transport. Um, equally, we can shim databases, again, so that whatever the database uses for auth, whatever the database's wire protocol is, we can talk a sort of unified, you know, for example, gRPC authenticated uh, protocol to it. And then maybe we've got a couple of front ends on front ends on that, right? So this is just sort of back end for front end pattern. So when the user calls in, they're going to get an HTML rendering, or they're going to get a REST API or a GraphQL API. So again, just something to bear in mind, uh, because when we, okay, animation's getting annoying now. When we uh, trace a request through a system like this, the sort of the chain that we get has just sort of front end, mid back end, whatever you want to call it, middle end, and then maybe a database shim. Uh, so this is just something to bear in mind for a bit later. So continuous deployment, continuous release, which is the sort of problem we're actually trying to tackle. I think CICD has been a hot topic for, you know, maybe two decades now. I'm going to look at the continuous deployment part of that and what that actually means. So say we've got our string of microservices, right? And there's a new version. There's a putative new version, a candidate uh, of one of them. I I'm going to call these things V1 and V2. You know, obviously they might be... 1.035 and 1.036 or whatever. Um, we, you might have multiple candidate versions uh, at a time, so multiple people working on multiple branches. That's all, that's all valid, that works, but V1 and V2 is simple. So if I've got this candidate version, it's in red, right, because it might not work yet, um, but we want to start deploying it. We want to, we want to test it. So how do we test it? Well, the agile, you know, agile testing pyramid says you should do something like this. Um, this isn't a bad model, it's not perfect. Um, but it's definitely not bad. You know, I have, to, I have to get that in there. I have to add, I think, before even the unit test, you've got a type system and a, like a borrow checker if you're using a good language. Um, but, I mean, the, the real point, when I'm not just shilling for Rust, is that the bottom parts like happen in, in isolation, right? You're, they'll happen in your CIC system. Anyway, you can run a Unix process. The top parts are sort of testing in context, if you like, right? They're testing with other services, and they, need to ha they actually have to happen in an environment. So if we're going to spin up a chain of services and do an end-to-end -end test, that's got to run in Kubernetes, right? That can't really be like a, a little test harness. So most people do the sort of integration tests and above the end-to-end -end -to -end tests like this. You have you know, the build environment that's doing the unit tests, the component tests, and then you'll have a test environment maybe that does the integration tests and a staging environment where we do the system tests. Um, to me, I couldn't find a real definition of, of this. There's a lot of copies of this picture on the internet. Nobody seemed to want to actually put a stake in the ground and give a definition for each of these levels. Um, but to me, system tests and manual tests are both end-to-end -end tests. You know, system tests are automated, I guess, and manual tests are, are done by a human. And then we have prod, where we actually release and where the service starts to get user traffic because we've tested it. So how do we run these integration tests? Well, that's easy enough. Um, you can do this in the Wild West. I'm sorry, I mean, I mean test, right? Anywhere you can deploy software. Um, but importantly, not CI. This isn't a sort of unit test. This, in order to do an integration test, a black box of service like this, it needs to be subject to you know, real runtime resource constraints, real runtime security constraints. It needs representative config files and environment variables. But we can deploy it to an environment, right? And the little robots are like, you know, test scripts that maybe call in, call out, test it like a black box. But how do we do that end-to-end -end testing, right? How do we do the sort of manual testing or, or automated end-to-end -end testing? We need to emphasize, exercise this service in, in context, in the context of this whole chain or more complicated graph. How do we do that? Well, we can have a staging environment where all the new versions are deployed, right? But this, this isn't representative because these aren't the versions. If we're testing you know, this one, we want to know how it behaves. When it gets deployed, it's not going to see the new version of this and the candidate version of this. It's going to be sitting in between the two production versions, right? As, you know, assuming service three is the one that gets through test and gets deployed first. Like this won't detect a breaking API change. 
right? Because if this, this relies on a new, this isn't backwards forwards compatible, it relies on a new API from here, this kind of testing isn't going to detect that. And this is obviously a big cause of breakages with microservices. So to get around that, we could have ephemeral environments. We could spin up a new environment for each service, you know, even for each, each PR, right? Each branch of each service. But these are hard to build. They're, you know, the automation's hard to build. They're expensive to run. And they're still not prod. They're still not representative. Anybody who's ever built one of these, you know, they're always a lookalike of prod, but they're, they're never really quite the same. So testing in production. Why, if we want it to be representative, actually testing prod, why not test in prod? Uh, the issue with that, right, is that our software is, is so Charity Majors has this I test in prod thing, which basically says you're never going to catch all errors in testing, just release it and like, and then deal with it when the users find things you'd never thought of. That's, I guess, a little stage on from this. Um, but when our software is under test, we're not ready to release it. We don't want users to be exposed to its results, right? We don't want it to get user traffic because the flip side is we don't want users to get results from it because they might be nonsense, right? It might still be broken. So we get to win if we can separate that deploy stage from the release stage, right? So if we can deploy it, if we can run the new version in production, subject to the, all, of, all of the quirks of the production environment, but we don't release it, where release means you know, it doesn't get user traffic, so there's no risk to the business. So we can separate deploy and release, you know, do we need separate test and staging and, and prod environments? You know, I would say not. I can say they can all be one thing. We can do all these things in the one environment. So how does that look like? What does that look like? Well, we now have the technology, right? What I really want to do is just, just test this V2. So the user traffic is you know, going to be coming in and getting V1, 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 because we know they're all stable. I want to be able to put it under test, get some test traffic to go V1, V1, up to V2 and then down to V1 again. So this is all going to be in prod. You know, this is the prod database that I can read you know, realistic data from uh, prod constraints, but it's still under test. So it's only getting traffic from the test bot. But the test bot, or, you know, or the user, the developer, is at the front of that chain. So they can't just sort of, you can kubectl port forward to, right to here, right? And you can do integration tests, but you can't, you can't do an end-to-end -end system test like that. So the test agent needs to be opt in, able to opt in to test versions of V2 at an arbitrary depth down that chain. So how might we do it? Um, well, if we add a sidecar proxy to every service, and then we add a control plane to configure those, well, we've got a service mesh, right? Uh, and with a service mesh, we can take advanced control, sophisticated control of all of the traffic in the cluster. We can do advanced routing. So we can deploy all of the V2s like in a staging environment, sorry, we can, well, but we deploy them into prod, but we don't let them get any user traffic because these sidecars are doing advanced routing for us. And we can then change those routing rules and we can put a little blip in the chain, right, and send things up to, up to V2. And this is all done by the service mesh. This is all in Kubernetes, configured by YAMLs. We're not fiddling around with IP tables or you know, VMware network shenanigans when we're not doing like layer three nonsense. This is all nice and Kubernetes native. So has this been done before? Well, yes, actually it has. This slide did not load, try reloading. Okay. Oh, it didn't load, but I can show it anyway. All right. All right. Oh, there you go, let's show it anyway. Um, oh, it's missing a QR code. It's missing the QR code is what it's missing. Okay, I don't know why. Um, so I put a QR code to cite this. Uh, I'm not getting a preview of it either. Um, so this was, this was kind of inspired by a talk I saw called Breaking Up Lyft Deployment Monolith, given by a Lyft engineer, Jay Kaufman, uh, Coupon London, earlier this year. Essentially doing what I showed with the proxies, uh, but Lyft has that. So Lyft are the people that made Envoy, right? And Envoy is the proxy that's used by Istio and a bunch of other service meshes. They, but they don't use Istio. They don't use one of the available service meshes because they were the first movers with Envoy. They've got their own custom thing, their own custom control plane. Um, so they did this. They managed to make this work, but it can't be reproduced by anybody else. And there was a bunch of sort of custom C. They had to fork Envoy and inject custom C++ code into it. So it, I think it was a great idea when I saw that talk. And they said, hey, this is the idea. Um, people should be doing this. But it wasn't reproducible. And I thought, 
I'm pretty sure I can configure Istio to do that, and then everybody can do it. So, can we do it with Istio? Well, yes, we can, right? Because Istio gives us those proxies as well. Istio gives us control plane. It gives us native Kubernetes-based configuration. So we can do it with Istio, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how. So just a, a quick recap, recap of the Istio configuration types, or the, the two that we're going to need, or maybe an introduction for people who've not used Istio before. Um, so these are CRDs, right, in Kubernetes. Um, we have the Istio virtual service, which is basically like given a request for a, for a name service, where do I send it? So if somebody's trying to send a request to service foo, in Kubernetes, right, you try to send a request to foo, you end up at the service capital S foo. But with Istio, like the virtual service kind of slots in before that. It says, okay, you wanted foo, you used you know, host foo in your, in your HTTP request, but where's it actually going? So I can select different real services if I want to. I can select uh, parts of them. I can sort of identify subsets of them and say, well, yeah, that one, but we're only going to part of it. Um, and I can, I can make those routing decisions based on headers or all kinds of other attributes of, of the request. So I can do, basically, this is what introduces the layer seven routing, right, that Istio, that, that, sorry, that Kubernetes can't do. And then the, the destination rule type, it says, right, when I've chosen, where I've chosen where I'm going to route it to, when we're going to, I'm going to go to, say, service two, how do I talk to that thing? So how do I load balance across all the pods in service two? Do I use TLS when I talk to them? And importantly, should I only talk to a subset of them? Should I pick out just a few of the pods in that deployment and only talk to them? So we've expanded, uh, blown up the sort of service chain here, right? This is, this is the previous, this is service two, this is, service four, and then for service three, like the naive Kubernetes way, right, is I make a deployment and I put a service in front of it and it selects, you know, app equals foo and I just select foo. Uh, and in this case, I've labeled the deployment version one. If I deploy a foo beta alongside foo stable, then, you know, I label it v2, but Kubernetes doesn't know any better. It's just going to send the traffic to both, right? The Kubernetes 101, sorry to teach you sucking eggs. Um, and it's going to do that relative to the, you know, proportional to the number of pods in each one. So I can come along with, and, I, and these could be replica sets rather than deployments, right? And that's how rolling update in Kubernetes works. So I can come along with these Istio CRDs instead, and I can slot that virtual service in front. I can make these two destination rules, and I can say, right, there's a subset of the, if this foo thing that's v1, and that's, that's this deployment, and there's a subset of this foo thing that's v2, and that's this deployment. I can then slot the virtual service for foo in front and as we'll see, it'll, it'll say, under some circumstances, I want to go to this V1 part of it, and under some circumstances, I want to go to V2. And my, I can tell my virtual service, right, your default config, your default mode, is to send all the traffic, so all of this is going through V1, right? So I can deploy V2, I can deploy it into prod, but I haven't released it, because it won't get any user traffic, it won't get any traffic at all at the moment, because the virtual service says, hey, I'm going to tell you how to tell V1 and V2 apart, send everything to V1. But I can add some config to that virtual service to say, oh, well, if the request comes in with, with a header, say X override, and it's right X override, I want foo v2, please, then that can be sent off to, to v2 instead. So any, you know, arbitrarily anywhere in the service graph, arbitrarily anywhere down that chain, if you've got a header that says, hey, I'd like to override foo to v2, we can send it through v2 and then back into the chain as normal. So this is, this is how we do, you know, what I'm talking about, this sort of testing in prod, this, this override testing. This is how we do what, recreate what Lyft did, and this is how we configure it with Istio. So what do those resources look like? Uh, if you've seen, you know, enough Istio before to follow this, uh, we've got a destination rule for foo, right? So we say that this is talking about the host foo, and this is the identity function, right? This is Istio 101. We're saying, well, there's two subsets in this case. Um, version one, and you identify that by a label on it that says version one, uh, and version two, which is identified by a label that says version two. We've then got the virtual service, which slots in front and does a little bit more routing. So this is going to be, I'm going to call this foo overrides, this thing. Um, it's looking again for any requests. You, you can actually override more than one service, but it's saying any request to go to foo, and then it's got this HTTP block. And that's where it's and again, pretty simple stuff, saying, right, match. Uh, the header, so match x override, if it says foo v1, then it's going to go to foo subset version 1. If it says foo v2, it's going to go to foo subset version 2. 
And then a last stanza at the end, so these, these routing rules, this is like Nginx config, right? These things are matched and applied in order. We then have like a default route, basically. It doesn't have a match section in it, which says anything that didn't match either the previous two. So people who, you know, people who aren't setting these override headers, they're just going to go to V1. So normal traffic flow V1, but if you opt in with a header, you can go off to V2. Or, of course, you know, that can be as long as you want in any, any other version. There's one little caveat with this. This isn't quite what they look like. You actually need to match like this. You actually need to use a regex to match uh, the middle of, to, to match this X override header. So it gets a little bit messy. Um, just to go through the practical details, right, in case anybody goes home and tries to re-implement this. The reason for that um, is we, we might have more than one override, right? I might want to go to Foo version 2 and then Bar version 3 and something else version 7. Um, so we might have multiple instances of this X override header because you know, the value is service version. Um, if, you, if you use curl to make this request, you with multiple X override headers, curl puts them on the wire as multiple keys, right? So you'll get two X override foo v1, X override bar v2. You'll get those separate headers. Um, that used to not be allowed by the spec. The spec used to say you had to condense them like one key several values with a comma between them. The spec, the, the new spec, I spent a long time reading RFCs. The new spec now says you, it, you're okay to send them uh, separately, send separate keys with, with values. So what we're doing is fine, right? And as I say, curl something like that, uh, Golang forwards them like that, because I'm doing the demo with a, with a Golang, a simple Golang thing. What Envoy presents you when you're trying to match these things is the single combined thing. Again, not against the spec, but a little bit of an old version. So you get, you get presented X override precisely once, no matter how many times you specified it, and you get the values collapse with, with commas. Uh, so we have to match a substring because we, we might have presented X override more than once. Envoy, if you're configuring Envoy manually, which you should never do, uh, gives you several ways of matching headers. I can say I want to match an exact string, a prefix, a suffix. I've got a regex. Or I can use the contains thing to match a substring. Istio only exposes part of Envoy's API, and Istio does not give you contains. Helpfully, Istio gives you exact prefix and regex. It doesn't give you contains. It doesn't give you suffix. So regex it is. Um, the regexes in Envoy are Google's RE2 syntax, which took me a while. Um, because it's a little different to other things, um, and that you have, to, and you have to match the whole string. So we end up with, I think this is the tightest you can get. I don't think we can be any tighter than that. But basically saying, well, you might be the caret, you might be the start of the string, you might be the end, you might be both, because it might be the only value for this header, but there might be something before it, and then a comma, there might be something after it. Anyway, just so you understand like what on earth that horrible regex was for. And this, took, this was the longest part, honestly. I was like, I can, I left that conference thinking, I can implement this in Istio, this is fine. This was honestly the longest part. Um, so the YAML's actually pretty simple, right? It's almost kind of basic Istio usage. But you're gonna need one of each of those resources, one destination rule, one virtual service for every, you know, every service, every workload you've got. You're gonna need a match for every version and it's gonna need to be updated every time a new version is deployed. So that's a pretty big combinatorial explosion, and it's ongoing work as well, right? If you're in an you know, automated CI/CD environment where multiple versions are going out all the time, you're going to need to be updating those things quite a lot. So it sounds like a great target for automation, and that's exactly what I did. Um, and it was writing this, you know, I sort of went home and thought I can do this, and I wrote this, and then that's what made me think I should give this talk uh, to sort of tell folks about it. So I've only got five minutes left. I'm going to try to give you a quick demo. Um, if anybody saw my tweet earlier, uh, it doesn't, the latest version oh, it doesn't work, but I was able to roll back, and the pre previous version does. Um, but anyway, it's good enough. Hopefully, everybody, oh, that's got a bit smaller than I thought. What does that say? No. No, no, definitely not. Oh, it's because I'm on, okay. I'm trying to, there we go, I'm trying to make my eye turn bigger. I can't see that screen, so by the power of TMUX, I have the TMUX, same TMUX session attached here. But anyway, um, so I've got a few scripts. 
just to make this a little easier. So I've got, I've got a cluster running. I've got Istio installed. Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, no. How far did I get? Oh, I didn't get very far at all. I was resetting this thing. Okay, bear with us while... Oh, that's how far I got. Okay. I've uploaded the images, uh, so we shouldn't be at the, the mercy of conference Wi-Fi. This should all learn quite quickly. Sweet. Oh, that's really... You're not seeing what you're meant to see. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. Um, Istio, promise. And then I can deploy a chain of services. This is why you script demos. This is why you screen record demos and sit at the back with a beer while the demo plays. But I didn't do that. Um, so we're just going to deploy uh, five services, two copies of each, right? So service one to service five, service one beta to service five beta. As I say, the images are loaded. And the, the services are just a little Golang thing I, I wrote, right? That uh, takes the request forwards it, including all the headers. Uh, and they, they log what they do. This hopefully shouldn't take too long. Oh, come on. What else can I talk about while, uh, while this is happening? Um, so yeah, currently the service needs to forward that header. One of the future pieces, so the way I mean, obviously, there are security issues with that, right? You're definitely going to need to filter that out at ingress, so a user can't set it. Um, you will have trust issues inside the mesh for that header because anything that's compromised can start heading it, setting it. Um, you know, if it's a massive security risk to be redirected to a, to a beta version, I don't know, but um, it's definitely something you don't want to make this into the Wild West, so you need to be able to trust that header. We could think of maybe some way of signing it, but actually what Lyft did was embed. They didn't use a header. They, they put this override information into the jot. So they passed a jot round for service to service auth anyway, and they were able to stuff the header into the jot. Um, that's something that I, I just honestly didn't have to have time to add to this operator yet. That's definitely a way to do it. Um, that also in, um, gives the possibility for some more interesting stuff. Uh, like we might want to do uh, like a conditional override so one of the things Tetrate's working on in its product is like conditional auth. So service A can talk to service B only if like service Z was further down the chain, right? So you have to go Z to A and then you're allowed to go to B. Imagine if we could, um, uh, you know, one solution to that is, is um, embedded nesting jots. So imagine if we could do that with this, right? I want the override version of the database shim only if I've been through the override version of service one and the override version of service two. So that's something I could start to to work on. I have no idea. Even if this was downloading, it should be quicker than this. I don't know what's going on. I'm probably not going to be able to show you this. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, somebody did say that Docker Hub is rate limiting KubeCon because we're all on the same IP. Is that what's going on? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Well, there you go. Honestly, I've loaded the... Um, I've been here before, and I've got a couple of scripts, one that pulls all the images out of Minikube and one that pushes them back in. So they should... That's why Istio came out so quick. They should be there. Oh, well, I'm not going to take your time with this. Uh, honestly, it works. Um, what we, we might have got enough. If we've got the services, that's actually enough to generate the metadata. Let me just push, push all these in. Where is... Uh, yeah. I wanted the HTTP log. That's my little thing. Like that's the thing that should be should be happening. Uh, we haven't got any of them, but we've got okay. We've got the services. So I think I, um, yeah. If we were to make a call down that chain, we would get primary and beta versions at random. Standard Kubernetes load balancing. Can't show you that. But what I can show you is the generation. Oh, this is just going to apply them. 
So this went in and it ran. So my code has got a CLI mode and an operator mode. So it can run as an operator, watch the services, the pods, the deployments, and continually emit the virtual services and the destination rules. Or there's a CLI mode, right? So you can um, try it out, see what it's going to do, integrate it into a GitOps pipeline, do that kind of stuff. Because all of you know, what I'm doing is derivable from uh, other permanent resources you've got. So this was the code running, and we just piped it into kubectl apply. So you can see it sort of found, it, I found a service, it found all the versions that back it. Um, if I run, I'm not gonna be able to show you this, so I will. So if I just run it, I'm running CLI mode locally, it's gonna connect to the cluster, right, and emit all of this stuff, and this, this looks as you would expect it to look. There's also an operator mode that uses exactly the same logic and just, just does a watch, I promise. So. That's all the demo we're getting. Thanks, Docker Hub. Um, correct emoji, I guess. Um, what else? Right, so there's a few caveats. This, the, you know, this was kind of a proof of concept, and I thought, I'll, I'll talk about it, and it does work, but I, I got a bit busy, so it does need a bit more work. I, at the moment, the thing basically needs a namespace to itself, right? It's gonna look at the services and emit VSs and DRs. Um, if you've got any other virtual services trying to do any more routing, they're just gonna clash. Uh, it does use, the operator does use server-side apply, but obviously it doesn't own those resources, so it gets a little bit tricky. I think there's a way around that with, um, you can delegate from one virtual service to another, so I think I might use an emission controller to patch anything I find to delegate and delegate to myself and then do this thing. I need to think about it, but at the moment it kind of needs a namespace for itself. It is alpha, um, you know, suggestions and PRs, welcome. Uh, yeah, so other stuff we might want to do, I talked about the header while we were waiting. Um, yeah, GitOps, so it's, uh, it's kind of like transient state, right, these things that we emit, but you can just, you can run the CLI mode as part of some kind of you know, generation pipeline that, that uh, produces YAMLs for your GitOps repo. Um, yeah, it's gonna clash with anything that exists, but I think I've got a couple of tricks I can use to fix that. Um, I probably don't have time to talk about that, but it's, well, I imagine if we could set up a route where I'm talking to, remember I talked about the different types of microservice, if one of them is a database shim, I might actually want to send get to the stable one, so I'm reading from the prod database, but posts, database writes, go to the, the V2 shim, the test shim, which is maybe just going to black hole them, right? Because a, a, a test order, I don't actually want it to go in the database. I don't want logistics to do anything. So imagine if we could do something like that. Um, and yeah, so if this thing's a database shim, right, I might say, hey, I've been through the, a test V2, so I actually want to go to a shim that's either going to send to a fake database um, or just you know drop writes in memory or something. So if, if we have this nice model of a, a logicless, you know, a stateless database shim service, then we can start doing these things and it becomes a lot safer. Um, yeah, conditional routing is what I just talked about. So yeah, um, that's really what I wanted to show. I wanted to talk about why we might want to do this, so that it's possible, show that it's possible in Istio, and then talk, show you how to do it, and then talk about the, the sort of automation I started using, if anybody wants to go home and, and do this themselves. Um, the one last thing I wanted to show is a sort of, if we're coming through, the, you know, the t as, as, as a service goes through, like it's CICD lifecycle, right, it gets built, it gets linted, uh, it gets unit tested, you know, and then we get to, right, let's test it in prod, so we're not sending user traffic to it. The basic way of doing that is by using a staging environment or an ephemeral environment. I've hopefully persuaded you of the problems with those. I think overrides what I just showed is the sophisticated way of doing that. And you then, that's really as much testing as we can do in isolation. We then get on to you know, releasing it, separate from deploying it, but we get on to releasing it, sending it unit tra um, user traffic. And you almost certainly want to do a rollout, right? You don't want to send it all the user traffic at once. Um, so the basic way of doing that kind of release is to let Kubernetes do a rolling update or to, to fiddle with DNS records on the edge. Um, the sophisticated way of doing that is, is Flagger. So I think a combination of this thing, you know, you deploy, your t tester comes along, sets the header, gets to isolate things and test them, and then you can let, you know, when you're happy with that, you press the button and Flagger start to do a rollout to real users. That's what I was gonna show, thank you. I shouldn't have told you the code was broken because if we couldn't, I could have just been, oh, Docker Hub. Sorry, I can't show you anything. Um, but I will fix the, the version 0.2 works and I will fix it. Um, 
I think that's the end of the slot. I'll be around if anybody wants any questions, but I won't, I won't keep you here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>